I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are here at the Grand National Roadster Show in Pomona, California. I'm walking around and there's Randy Clark. We've had Randy Clark on the show before. We did a wonderful interview with him a couple of years ago when he talked to us about the M80. Well, Randy Clark is the proud owner of hot rods and custom stuff and we are going to take a look at his facility. Is that right, Randy? You, you have invited us out there? Yeah, we'd be glad to show you the shop. Or did you just really respond to about 10 emails where I harassed you to get into your shop? A little of both. All right. Well, through the magic of television, we are going to go to Randy's shop, and that is going to happen right about now. Oh, it's like magic, Randy. Here we are in Escondida, California. I'm glad to have you here. Great. This is uh, your company is Hot Rods and Custom Stuff, right? Yep. Hot Rods and Custom Stuff, established in 1989. So here in 89, but you've been doing this for a long time. A little over 40 years, Lance. But uh, we started this company in 1989. Peaches finally got mad at me and said I had to come to town. I couldn't work at home anymore. Peaches would be your wife. Yep, Peaches right. Clark. Okay, well, why don't we go into your shop and just find out what happens when somebody brings a car here to be worked on and kind of go through the whole process, okay? Yeah, I'd be glad to show you. All right, let's take a look. All right, Randy, let's say I go out and get a 55 Chev that's a little bit rough, and I want you to either restore it or customize it or do whatever. I bring it to you. What's the process? What happens? Well, the very first thing we do, Lance, is we bring the car in and take many, many, many pictures of it, pre-disassembly pictures, and then after the car is completely disassembled, we would blast it, removing all the paint, old Bondo rust, and then we would take the car, get it into bare metal, and then have you come back in we'd have a meeting with you showing you what condition your car really is in and then we would go to our next phase in the shop which would be the body work or rust repair so when the guy that's selling me the car says this this, this is all steel there's no bondo in here i bring it to you we find out something totally different that way you're kind of covered and i'm educated Pretty much we can't do a car without going all the way to bare metal because I have to guarantee the quality of the work that we do. And by going clear to bare metal, starting with the original metal in the body, working out from there, we can guarantee all of our work. Okay, so I've had my car here. It's been bead blasted. It's bare metal. We have uh, talked about what condition it's in. What's next? The next uh, product that we would put on the car is that we would prime all of that bare metal to keep it from rusting and that's a two-part epoxy primer that we use, DP90, and PPG product. After we put that on there, we would do all of the rust repair and body work right over the top of that. Okay, well, let's take a look at that step. Okay, all right. glad to show you. So this particular Nova has gone through the bead blast process. This is bare metal we're at right now. Yes, it is. Every, this car's been totally disassembled, bead blasted with our garnet blasting, and we're now getting ready to put this in black primer, DP90. That will seal all the seams, stop it from rusting, and throughout the process of while we're doing all the rest of the work, no further rust will form under the DP90. And the bead blasting, for the viewers that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's a medium, and it's, there's all kinds of different ones for different types of metal, right? And it's, it's blasted out of a gun, it, it hits the side of this, knocks off whatever's there, right? It's uh, an abrasive that we use at low pressure, high volume, and will not distort or warp any of the body panels, like hoods, deck lids, or quarter panels. It comes out of a gun kind of like a spray gun. Just like sandblasting. So it's in this particular condition, it's bare metal, it comes into this particular room and gets coated with primer, right? Right, that's what we do here. Is there, uh, the, the actual primer that goes on it, does the future plans for the car dictate at all what kind of primer is on there or how it's done? It would dictate the color of the primer. If a customer, if we're going to do a red car, we would use a red oxide colored primer. Gray, black, green, depending on what toners we'll use in the final paint. And also in some restorations, we would try to keep as close to the original primer color as possible. Okay, well, let's take a look at the next step. So Randy, the car has been bead blasted, it's been in bare metal, it's been primered, and, and this is where you see your clients, your customers burst into tears when they find out what was really under that uh, paint and, and the, under the Bondo and what was left of the metal, right? Absolutely. The rust repair portion of our business 
comes to light right here. If you look at these pieces, you can see that the uh, Bondo has been filled in, old repairs. We call it cover-up, and we don't do that. So when the customer brought this in, this was nice and finished and painted, and now we uh, have a beehive or whatever going on there. That car looked great when it came in. Only thing is the customer wanted to get the paint job redone, and the only way it can be painted is to start with bare metal. And those are the kind of problems that we find, old repairs that need to be redone. How courageous are your customers? Do most of them just say, I'm in this, so keep going? Or do some of them get to this point and go, I had no idea, thanks a lot, here's what I owe you, i got to move on? Most people know that uh, restoring these kind of cars takes a little bit of money, and they're pretty much committed to doing these jobs when we start. This is the only portion of the job that we cannot estimate right very closely is the rust repair itself because we don't have x-ray vision. I have a friend who had a has a 54 Studebaker that he was having it, it redone. It was a custom, really nice one. Bought it, was told there was no Bondo in it. Took it to a shop uh, way up in the Seattle area and the back end was so bad they just said this can't be fixed. They had to go out and find a donor car and put a new back end. Do you ever run into anything that extreme? Yes, we've had a couple of projects. One gentleman brought in a real nice Pontiac Firebird convertible that when we blasted the car he actually accused me of switching cars on him because the car that he had bought was definitely not the car that we showed him in bare metal. So was steam coming out of your ears at that point or were you laughing at that point? I was more upset than he was because I thought we had a really good job and then we found a sledgehammer beat in quarter panel with another quarter panel on top of it. So they had really, really did an incorrect job of fixing that guy's car. Yeah, they fixed, we fixed it right. Yeah, they fixed him good, didn't they? So Randy, we have seen that uh, a lot of surprises in that last body. What happens next? The next thing we do is we repair all of that. We cut out the rust, make new panels and do the body work on the rusted components of the truck cab or fender. This would look just like this right here. After we're done, we would have rust in the bottom of all old pickup trucks. A lot of cars that are from the Midwest had a lot of rust and we have to repair that, replace panels, and then we do the body work, then we put it in primer, and then we block sand it to 320. At that point, it would then go to our paint shop. So you mentioned to me earlier that this area right here used to look like this area right here correct very similar very similar and we made a new panel for it made new floors for this truck and replaced all around the window trim where it had uh, held moisture held water and rusted away okay we're making progress what's the next step the next step is to fit all the doors we would fit the fenders the hood and everything put it on the chassis make sure that all the components that we've done the body work to fit right door gaps and so forth and then disassemble it and go to paint i think you have some examples of that step in the next building should we take a look be glad to show you all right we've talked about what goes on on the surface of cars but what goes on underneath and what do you find there and what kind of changes you make most of the folks want to have everything restored and they want performance upgrades, brakes, better steering, better suspension than the old 40, 50 year old cars. And that's the department that we're standing in front of right now. We redo the chassis completely depending on customer request, motor, transmission, rear end, and all steering and brake components. So the majority of them end up with a whole new chassis rather than just a front clip? Pretty much. The rear ends would be uh, replaced, most of the older cars didn't have good braking so the brakes are replaced and we just basically do complete safety upgrades. And you have a jig here where you're just taking the fresh raw metal and, and bending it and welding it and doing what you need to do to get everything in the right place. We do build uh, quite a few frames, yes. What's the most challenging situation you've ever run into with a, a chassis? Any, any good story there? Uh, we've got one right behind us right now. I'll be glad to show you. All right, let's take a look. All right. Randy, you mentioned this was something unusual, and I'm looking at it and trying to figure out what it is. It's one of the more complicated cars we've done in quite a while. It's a 1970 Ford Bronco. Customer brought it to us and asked for something different. So what we did is we sat down with Eric Brockmeyer and some of the folks here at the shop and designed a vehicle that uh, 
is a little longer than a stock 70 Bronco, a little wider, a little taller, and a lot more performance. It's got a quick change in the front and a quick change in the rear. It's going to have inboard disc brakes and it's going to be street driven. Small block injected Ford motor with a C6 automatic transmission. So this isn't likely to end up running across the sand dunes. This is going to be more at the uh, local drive-in and up and down the cruising roads. The only time this thing will be off-road is if it accidentally gets on the guy's curb or on his lawn, I'm sure. If your construction methods make him too confident, they're going to end over sideways. It's going to be a fun project. We're looking forward to finishing it. What was the inspiration? You haven't done this kind of thing before, right, this particular? We've done a few four-wheel drive vehicles, but we haven't done anything like this. So you just look at the, the challenge, the, what you want the end product to be, and just start sketching and talking with your crew and, and get the welders out and, and cutting torch and go to town? We have some, uh, some of the young guys here that work with us are four-wheel drive guys. They know quite a bit about it, much more than I do, and we take their input, and uh, we're building something kind of fun. Randy, it looks like you're putting a big puzzle together here. What's going on here? Well, we built a frame for 1932 Fords, and we built it a little bit longer, three inches longer, and that's what we do in this fixture is build our frame. 32 Fords had a flat frame, and our frame has a little radius in it. As you notice the curve in the front portion of it there, it keeps everything up under the bottom of the frame rail. Nothing hangs underneath it, and that's what this fixture is for, is to assemble our frame. And this fixture, the, the jig, I mean, everything is... Um, adjusted for whatever type of frame you're making and then the pieces have to fit within that? It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle and we mark it all. All of these parts are laser cut and pre-bent and they fit into the fixture. We build the frame rails on a separate fixture and then we take them out of that fixture and put them in this fixture, weld the double K members in, motor mounts, front and rear cross member and when we're done here we pull it out, turn it over, do a little bit of touch-up welding and it's a completed frame. You mentioned this was longer than the normal 32 frame, and one of the reasons is that so it'll take a variety of different bodies? We can actually put a bigger motor in it. Okay. The stock bodies or any replacement body for a 32 Ford will fit on our frame. All of the length is from the firewall mounting bolt forward in our frame. Speaking of which, you build a replacement body for 32 is correct? We build a fiberglass replacement body for 1932 Fords. It's a cabriolet with a removable convertible top with power windows, heat, air, defrost. Mm -hmm. Great. A, a nice new old car. Randy, it looks like some progress is beginning to be made here. What, what step are we here? Okay, this car has been stripped to bare metal. Rust repair has been done. Body work's been done. We've now reassembled the car on its chassis and it is going to be checked out for deck lid fit, front fenders fit, make sure that the hood fits and works correctly, door fit, and then it will be final blocked and then sent to our paint shop. So a lot of work happens right here and then the, the kind of the, the first really sexy thing to happen to the car is getting that paint on there. That's the next step? Once we've got some color on it and it's in the paint booth, then it really, uh, they start to shine. Okay, can we see some shine? You bet. The car has been bead blasted, it's been primered, it's been fixed. It's been put back together to test fit all the doors and trunks, and then it's taken apart and painted, correct? Yes. Once uh, all of that work has been done, then it comes over to our paint shop, and we bring it in here. We suspend all of the components, and this is a Garmat downdraft booth, good and clean booth. It's controlled heat. Uh, we're, we're able to control our airflow through the booth, and all the cars that we paint completes are painted in this booth. How do you assure that the paint is going to be the same when you pull it apart like this and you're painting the doors and then you're painting the body, how do you know that they're all going to match perfectly? All solid colors can be painted in pieces just like this and we mix all the paint, pre-mix all of the paint. If we need uh, uh, six quarts of paint will mix two gallons of paint to make sure that we do not run out of paint. All the paint is pre-mixed and what we call batched where we mix it all together so that all the paint's the same color. And then with solid colors you don't have any problems as far as mismatching the panels. Metallics are a different story. 
What kind of changes have you seen, say, in the last 20 years from the way things were done then to now in painting? Well, because of uh, a lot of the new rules and regulations here in the state of California, uh, the paint is different now than it used to be and uh, much harder to work with. Is it the, f the final product, is it better, or do you, you long for the good old days and the paint you had back then? Well, I'm much too young to remember the good old days, so I like what we're using today. Uh -huh. All right, after this, everything, the, the pieces are painted, what happens next? The next thing we do with all these components is that we will take and cut and polish, which means we wet sand all of the painted surfaces and polish them with the buffer. The components of the car have gone into the spray booth, they've been painted, they end up here, what happens here? Okay, all of the imperfections in the paint job, in the clear, when paint is sprayed today, it has a ripple effect. It has what we call orange peel in it. It is not smooth like you would want the paint to be. So what we do is we block sand, wet sand the surface with sandpaper and water, and we end up with a surface that is very dull. And then we take polishing compound and buffers, and we will buff back the surface finish to where it is as smooth as glass. That's what happens in this part right here. So the sandpaper that you're using is, is such a low grit that it's not doing any permanent damage, it's just knocking down the high spots and then there's enough there that you can just buff it out. We actually get down to 1500 grit and it's very, very, very fine. There will be no scratches at all and what very fine scratches are left are removed with the buffer. Let's take a look at a car that it, all that has happened and it's put together with the paint job finished. Good, I got one right over here. All right. We've gone through the process of the car being taken apart, being fixed, being put back together, being painted, the final steps of the paint put back together. Looks like we have the end product here. Yes, this is what they look like when we're done. This is a 1940 Ford Woody that we built for uh, Ted and Nancy Harkson in Bakersfield, California. And he had bought this car in 1960 and we were really proud to give it to him at the beginning of the Grand National Roadster Show. I understand this was in more than rough shape than when you got it. Uh, this car was a refugee from a wrecking yard in 1960, so you can imagine the condition it was in. Doing the wood on these, that must be, uh, of course, it's a whole different thing. It's, it's hugely time-consuming, I would think, and takes a real talent for that. We use Chris Masano, and he does a great job for us. Uh, I personally have never done a wood-bodied car. I wouldn't know where to start, but... Some folks that have worked on boats and done woodies for years, like Chris, he just does a great job. Woodies are very difficult to build. Well, the wood is gorgeous, the paint is gorgeous, and just as gorgeous to those is the interior. This is really good looking in here. I understand you have a shop here. You take care of the upholstery yourself? We do all our own upholstery here at Hot Rods. We have uh, John Noel, who's been doing this for a number of years, and... Uh, we're able to control the quality and the time frame on our completed restorations and hot rods by having in-house interior shop. As we've gone through your facility, something that has just stood out as well as a paint job is the interiors are just very, very nicely done. I understand Jean Noel here is responsible for that? He's the man that takes care of all of our interior work. Uh, he works with the customers for the colors and design and he's got a number of years of experience. He's doing a great job for us. 
Uh, do you agree with him? You think you're as good as he's telling us you are? Uh, I may be better. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. How long did I know it, it would depend on the customer's demands and, and the job, but is there, uh, are we looking at, at weeks or months or how long does it take to go through an, an average job or is there such a thing as an average job? Uh, I say around 200 hours. 200 hours, huh. Have you seen any changes? Of course, we went through rolls and pleats and diamond tuck and rolls and pleats again and it, all different types of interiors over the years. What's the kind of latest thing? What's the cutting edge of interiors now? What What are you seeing being asked for? Hmm. I think the maybe old school style. So going back to the rolls and pleats. Yes. Is there a big change between the rolls and pleats that are done now, this the way they're sewn and the style, and the way they were done 30 years ago, or is it pretty much the same thing? It's pretty much the same thing. Just quality of material and yeah, the form, the material, the tools are a little bit different and a little bit better. Any prediction for what the future is as far as upholstery? Hmm. No, I don't know. We just follow the customer uh, what they want. <laughs> I've got a background in a lot of automotive related things and, and I'm, I'm here to help you out. I want you to know my senior year in high school I was a few credits ahead so I had to take a course and I took an upholstery course and I, was, I successfully in six months upholstered a bar stool. So was any tips I can give you? Uh, maybe not, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe stay off the bar stools, that might be a good tip. All right, thank you, Sean. You're welcome. A beautiful 1932 Ford what could be better? This is absolutely gorgeous. This is our 1932 Cabriolet. It's a reproduction of a Ford Cabriolet. We call it the American Peerless. This is a fiberglass body with power windows, defroster, air conditioning, everything that the ladies want to have so that they'll go riding with you in your topless car. This is a good example of just about everything that you guys do here in the shop. Yes, we built this whole car in the shop. We built the frame. J.B. Donaldson, a company uh, buddy of mine over in Arizona, builds the bodies for us. Tom Rootley builds the hoods for us. But it's our design, our car, and completed the way we want it. The cars that you've completed here have gone on to win some of the biggest awards in the nation over the last many years. Can you share some of that with us? Over the years, we've been very fortunate to have some really good customers. We've been able to build some fun cars. Uh, we won uh, the Grand National Roadster Show pickup class with sweepstakes pickup back in 98 with Frank Gorens. We've won, uh, very fortunate to win the Riddler with uh, the M80, very well-known car, came out great. Didn't start out to be what it ended up to be, but that was a fun one. And over the years, we've had uh, real good luck, customers uh, having nice cars, and we have won a few awards. If somebody is out there and they'd like to talk to you about the possibility of becoming one of your customers, how do they go about that? Well, they could just give us a call at the shop. Uh, we've got a 1-800 number. It's 1-800-HOT-ROD-5. And uh, then we've got a website, www.HOTRODSCUSTOMSTUFF.COM. So they can just get a hold of you and say, I have this, uh, say like a 58 Rambler American or something really cool like that. And what would it cost to have that done? Yours is already finished, Lance. <laughs> well, some people don't think so. Randy, thank you very much for being on the show. For coming. I really appreciate it. This is a, a fine example of real craftsmanship here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,